This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we have a distinguished guest, and his name is Dr. Anil Rajwanshi. He's also known as what we call a spiritual engineer. He's pioneering rural development work for the last three decades has spanned a whole spectrum of areas affecting the lives of rural population. He established the Energy and Sustainable Development at NIMCAR Agriculture Research Institute, and he has received many prestigious awards. Thank you for coming to our show, Anil. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. You're I'm most really welcome. happy. Yes. So, uh, Anil, your story and journey is a remarkable success and fascinating story. Please tell us your life journey for our global audience. Your story should resonate well with millions of people across the globe. And it says that if you aim high, work hard, you can achieve your dream. And I hope yes. your hope lives on and your dream shall never die. Uh, you know, uh, thank you for serving the humanity and giving your helping hands to those who need the most, who are, with, who are the vulnerable or who are socially and economically disadvantaged. Thank you very much. Uh, I was born and raised in Lucknow, which is the capital of Uttar Pradesh. I did my schooling there in San Francis. Then I went to IIT Kanpur to do my B.Tech in mechanical engineering in 1967. I finished my B.Tech and M.Tech from IIT Kanpur. Then as most of the Indians uh, from IITs do, I went to United States to do my PhD. I went to do my PhD under a very famous professor in solar energy. And I did my PhD in mechanical engineering in University of Florida, Gainesville. Wow. And then I taught there for two and a half years. Wow. And before this madness, this janoon, this thing that I felt that with my knowledge, I will change India. So I came back. India is a very ancient civilization of thousands of years, India did not change, but it changed me. And that has been my story. Well, I came you, back. So you came I, back and, uh, uh, you know, um, Anil, you do try to couple uh, the your high technology and learning skills to promote the rural development in backward areas of India. You remind us the technology plays a significant role in the development of the rural technology, rural areas. Can you shine a bright light by giving an example to illustrate your thoughts? Yes, for example, when I came back, uh, I saw that the people were uh, um, still using the lanterns, which were uh, running on kerosene. It was very polluting. Kerosene was imported uh, almost wholly from Russia in those times in 80s. And uh, then I said, uh, what can we do to produce our own fuel and also to improve this lantern, which had not been uh, changed for the last 100 years. So I did a very uh, detailed work in improving the lantern and running, running it on alcohol, which we could grow and we, which we could produce locally. And that pioneered the whole concept of cooking and lighting using ethanol, which became a very big program, not only um, uh, World Bank and other um, uh, Organizations have taken it up now. And uh, I then started looking at what different materials we should use. And we set up the world's largest program of using sweet sorghum, which is a multi-purpose crop from the same piece of land. You get fuel and food. Wow. And, then, and then we did that work. So what in all this process, I felt that high technology is the answer in solving the problems of rural India. And in 1980s, this was a very new concept. Now everybody talks in the world about using high technology for rural development. In fact, it is called as a frugal innovations, but that at that time, it was a very, very novel concept. So we did so many things in, uh, for example, the, this whole e-rixha was, was started by I was by gonna me. ask you, yeah. Yes, the whole e-rixha, 
a whole e-rickshaw was started by me because of the fact that I came from Lucknow, where the only mode of transport in my when I was young was rickshaws. Right. And I felt that as a mechanical engineer, I should be able to improve it. So when I started talking with the rickshaw walas, they said, "Can you please give us a motor?" And I felt that rather than giving them an internal combustion motor, can I um, uh, give them a totally uh, uh, clean um, uh, a cl- a green uh, motor? And right. at that time in 1990s, uh, the electric motors and batteries had just started coming in. So I think I pioneered the whole concept of e-rickshaws. MIT in Boston used to publish a journal, and they put right. my rickshaw as a, on the main cover when I developed the first e-rickshaw anywhere in the world. My it goodness, I'm so it proud copied, of you. I'm and it is now copied all over the world. Yes. <laughs> and it still so, works. Yes. I, I have my first rickshaw, which I made in 2000, and it is now almost uh, 20 years. And it has logged around 50,000 kilometers, and uh, it runs very beautifully. Now, you also uh, founded, or uh, you're involved with uh, Nimkar Agriculture Research Institute. Tell us a little yes. bit about what it is, what's the goals and objectives, and how, what is it located, and how do you sustain yourself in terms of the funding? Uh, this Nimkar Agriculture Research Institute was uh, founded by my father-in-law, uh, Mr. Uh, B.V. Nimkar, and uh, it was started in 1968. Uh, B.V. Nimkar set up the first private seed company called Nimkar Seeds with the help from Rockefeller Foundation. Okay. So we have, a, we have a very long history of American uh, involvement. Associations, yes. My wife's grandmother was an American and the daughters of revolution. My goodness. So, so my wife is basically <laughs> a descendant of Robert Morris. Robert Morrison. Robert Morris, the yeah. the man who the man who um, uh, was signed uh, the only three of them who signed the Board Declaration of Independence and the um, uh, I think the uh, Constitution. Wow, you should be proud of uh, uh, yes, your yes. Uh, your heritage and your history. Yeah. Especially yes. your wives. That's not yes. you. Yes. But, uh, so, so Mr. Nimkar started the uh, institute in 1968 as the first private research in, agriculture research institute in India. So we are now 50 years old. And it is situated in the um, uh, small rural town of Fulton, which is in western Maharaj. Okay. We do work in the areas of agriculture, renewable energy, animal husbandry, and sustainable development. Most of our funding comes from sponsored projects, both uh, by companies, then CSR funding, and then government funding. But it's always a hand-to-mouth existence because no, very few people like to give money for research. Right. <laughs> Same thing and, true in the United States. Yes, yes, but in India it is worse because most of the funding now is going towards uh, with, uh, to the government uh, institutions. In fact, we just got a project from... Uh, uh, DST, Department of Science Technology, and they told us we are the only NGO they have funded. So it's a very, uh, it's not a very easy way to get funds. I was uh, intrigued by uh, uh, by the concept of a rural restaurant. What yes. is a rural restaurant, and what does it do? And uh, when we were, uh, yes, when we were working with these uh, very poor people. Uh, when we developed this new type of land stove, lantern cum stove, this land stove produces light, and in the heat of the light, it cooks a complete meal for a family of five. Wow. So we we introduced this in the uh, non-electrified huts, around 25 of them, and we used to go and interact with them, ask them um, uh, what do they do, what are the um, uh, problems, etc., and we found that. Most of these women who work for six to seven hours in the sun, in the fields, they come so tired. And yet when they come home, they are supposed to cook Cook. a complete meal for the family of five or six, whatever it is. Right. Now, nobody would be in there, uh, would like to cook when they're so tired. So we felt, and then we started asking them the problems and we found they were spending a lot of money on the medicines. Because they were getting sick all the time, because they, they, their, their food was very poor. And uh, so we felt that the best thing to do is to have rural restaurants where they can all go and eat. They will get uh, good food 
and so they don't have to cook at home the misery of the chore of the cooking will go away at the same time there will be less pollution and my idea came from uh, the fast food restaurants i said i'm not going to give fast food to them but a simple thali which yeah. will which will because for a poor person poor person the best medicine is a food i agree so if you give them good wholesome food then all their problems go away and i was i am very happy to say that this was the starter for amma's kitchen in 2013 oh okay and now the uh, maharashtrian uh, shiv shahi food and the interesting part is they all copied it from my work in fact it was so uh, uncanny that in uh, maharashtra they have put the figure as 10 rupees per thali which i had put in my paper in 2012 so i have two questions who how do you sustain yourself when you get the money to to feed these people which is a wonderful thing to do and can you task can you put this thing in lucknow and up because they really need this kind of help yeah well see i suggested that this should be the excellent csr activity right corporate social responsibility that's a very because well pro- because providing good food or providing simple food to these people and in fact all the today what is happening in the um, uh, all this migrant labor Uh, yeah. problem this would have been solved if people would have uh, looked at it from that point of view both the government and the um, uh, corporate sector and yes. and i when i talked with a lot of these corporate people they said 10 rupees per thali is a very doable goal and 10 rupees is um, nothing you know you get a, a, a nice thali for that wow I, i'm so uh, i'm so energized and and excited what you're doing you talk about the Uh, the migrant rural crisis because of the covid-19 i know yes. it is a global crisis i know it's an unprecedented upheaval that we hold dear to our daily lives their struggle and their sacrifice our struggle and our sacrifice and we are in this together so tell us a little bit about uh, what are you doing and how do you see your work with the, uh, in mitigating the migrant crisis well first of all we don't have uh, too many migrants here in uh, our area but um, bihar bihar and other part of the world has it. yes they, they have of, uh, other right. part of india right so first thing what we did was to whoever is working with us we told them to you continue working we uh, made them have a social distancing followed all the norms of uh, cleaning their uh, the hands and etc uh, putting the mask because not only they need money to fill up their stomach but they also need work for their mental yeah and so they were all very happy that we never told them to sit at home so that in our from our point of view we did for in our institute and uh, whoever uh, we we said to them that if there are some migrants and if they need any help regarding food and etc they are most welcome but then we never got any migrants because there are no migrants in this part of the see most of the migrants are in the big cities such as big, most of the migrant laborers were in big cities yeah pune mumbai etc who came from uh, bihar up and so on and so forth but i feel that there should have been much more humane yes um, uh, mechanisms to yeah. deal with that Yeah. you know most of these people are poor people if you had just given them a place to stay and food they would have been happy they I didn't agree. they were not asking for money so that is what i feel should have been done to them my my, uh, my heart is broken when when i see the misery and what they go uh, and their struggle what they go through it is the government lending and uh, helping them also to and and they should make use of what you doing well um, um, uh, it, it will take some time to find out uh, this big packet that uh, prime minister modi has uh, announced how it will affect them what will happen we are not sure right now but um, um, only time can tell but i think uh, that misery could have been reduced drastically if right at the beginning um, it would have been said that please help them we will give you money because nobody was asking for uh, loans or etc they were just asking for simple money to feed them that's all and feeding does not take too much money i agree i'm with you 100% <laughs> so have you made that do you think it's incompetence and ineffectiveness in aptness of the 
current government? Well, I, I, you know, see, I'm not a part of the government, nor do I. So I, I sit, I sit 1,500 kilometers away from them. Right. Well, whatever I read, I uh, react to it, and uh, it is very difficult to tell when uh, you have a government just like you also have in the United States. Yes. Know all, know all. When, when the top people think that they know everything, the whole wisdom of the world is with them. So it's very difficult to <laughs> think <laughs> and, and advise them. <laughs> you, you said it very well, and I hope we make the change in the United States. And we, are, uh, and we, we will make the change, and we, we need I, a I change. So. We need so. a new leadership. I want to talk a little bit about, you are an inspiring speaker and a writer on spirituality, and you have a strong belief in coupling high technology and spirituality for India's development. Uh, so my question to you is, what, what is the concept of this spirituality that you're talking about it, and what will be your message to the South Asian who wants to follow in your footsteps, especially the young generations? And before we close our conversation, Anil. Uh, I personally feel that spirituality is nothing else but going deeper inside, knowing your, yourself. It is not religion. It is beyond caste, creed, religion. It's a transcends our boundary. It's transcends our boundary, right? It is. It is. It is, it is a human enterprise. Right. Each each human being is capable of going deeper inside and understanding it. When you do that, it gives you humility. It tells you not to have greed. It reduces your greed, and when you couple that with high technology, then you produce a very sustainable lifestyle and happiness. And I have written extensively on that, spirituality plus technology. In fact, that's my latest book, Spirituality plus Technology is Equal to Happiness. I have made it freely available because I believe that the knowledge should be freely available. In fact, all my books are freely available on the internet because I want the youngsters to read and contemplate and think about these issues. And I believe that if all of us follow this uh, example of spirituality plus technology, high technology, then we all will can lead a sustainable and very happy life. And that, to my mind, has, should have been the biggest uh, lesson for post-COVID world. If we become sustainable, then we can also become a very happy society. Uh, oh, uh, that's a very well said. Uh, so if, if somebody is listening to in this audience who are young and who has a full of energy, full of enthusiasm, they want to serve the humanity like this, what would be your message to them uh, in terms of uh, following, not necessarily in your footsteps, but serving the humanity, just like what you're doing? The, uh, the, the, this is what I, uh, the uh, uh, talk I give to a lot of IITians and etc. youngsters. Right. I tell, I tell them that you do things about which you feel passionate. Very well. You should you, you should you should love doing your things. Somebody should not tell uh, you what to do. And when you look a little, spend time for yourself. Don't be all the time on your laptop or your SMS or doing etc. Because then we have become just like animals. We react. If we contemplate, because human brain is a very huge brain, which is meant for contemplation. When you start contemplating, you start looking deeply, and then you start looking at things from a very different perspective. And when you do that, then you start helping uh, yourself and others surrounding you. And as, Gandhiji, well and as Gandhiji said, be the change that you want to see. You, so, you, you, yeah, you're absolutely said that. Uh, uh, you know, I just gave a speech at Martin Luther King uh, birthday, and I made that a comment that the Martin Luther King got the idea of the nonviolence from Mr. Gandhi when he visited India in 1950. And there's an indelible connection between the two. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and thank you for all you do to make a profound difference in people's lives. And this is Frank Islam wishing you a great week and thank you for watching.